service, starting mileage 8531, 8531, to Texas Perkins and Southwick, 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. on the night watch. 954, 604 p.m., starting night watch. This is Don Reed. I'm a police recorder. You're riding in a detective unit reporting in service on the night watch. As you go along with us tonight, remember, this is it. This is real. This is what happens on the night watch. Night watch. The actual on-the-scene report of your police force in action. There are no actors. There is no script. Every voice, every sound is authentic. The investigations are recorded as they actually occur. Night Watch is presented with the cooperation of the Police Department of Culver City, California, W.N. Hildebrand, Chief. We switch you now to car 54 on patrol and to police recorder Don Reed. We've been uh, patrolling now for a little over three hours. Things are pretty much routine. A few moments ago, we took a stolen car report. But at the present time, we're cruising uh, west on... Four, at Minutes and Elma Drive. That's Venice and Elma Drive, a traffic accident. Advise of an ambulance is needed. The call is code three. Car 5-2, this is 5-4, this is called... 5-4, 10-4. Checking out the smashed vehicle. Strong smell of gasoline in the air. Apparently just one person involved. Driving the car? Sergeant Perkins is checking out the victim. I was coming down the street. And somebody's coming against me. And I, I turned to avoid the... You know, the collision. And that's what happened. Came over here. Did you skid over here or what? Lose control of the car? Well, I, I mean, I, I can't really tell you what happened. The car lost balance. The car lost its balance. Yeah. I mean, Are you injured at all? Pardon? Did you get hurt at all? Are you injured? No, sir, I'm not. Been drinking tonight? Yes, sir, I have. How much you been drinking? I had a couple of beers. You've had more than a couple, haven't you? That's all. Just two? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. How, how long ago? Oh, about two hours ago. You're very fortunate to get out of this accident without being killed. Well, my, car, my car's uh, out of balance. Your the car? guy that I bought it off of, we're going to have it fixed up tomorrow, see? The wheels are out of balance. Well, your car's out of balance now, that's for sure. You take a good look at that Just car. stepping back for a moment. The officers are involved in considerable double talk with the driver of the car right now. But in the interest of getting the facts, they're going along with it. At least, for the moment, anyway. And then again, there is the possibility the officers may be subpoenaed into court to testify regarding the accident, and the victim is entitled to have his version presented. And speaking of him, the subject in this case is waving his arms right now and gesturing wildly, trying to explain to the officers, who, uh, by the way, are from time to time doing a little ducking. Uh, so having um, had a little experience in the art of self-defense myself, let's, uh, let's move right back on in. Well, you're very fortunate that you weren't hurt and somebody else wasn't hurt. That's the main thing. Who was hurt? I see. You were fortunate that nobody else was hurt. No, you I, I avoided the other car. I had that right. fool like cut out of the way. And I'm over here upside down like I fool like I didn't even know where I'm at. Now, if you hadn't been drinking so much, you probably wouldn't have even come close to an accident. Are you kidding? No, I'm That guy was on the wrong side of the street and he was coming at me. Well, Susan, what what you're, am you're, I going to do? It seems to me that you ended up on the wrong side of the street. What, what was that going to do? What side did I he had to cut out of him. Did he pass you on your left or your right side? 
He was coming out of me straight ahead. I had to use my own judgment. Cut right or cut left. Okay, look, look, look. You told yeah, me three... I cut oh, wait a minute. You told me three times he was coming straight at you. Did he pass you? No, he was coming straight at me. Well, he had to pass you or did he do just stop and watch you roll over? No. Well, he did he pass straight you? straight at me. Did he, he pass you? At me. Well, did he hit you? No. Then what happened to him? Did he go up the opposite direction and pass I you? I don't know what happened. After I cut out, you might have gone wherever you wanted to. You're so drunk now, you don't know what happened. Look, According you want a conviction or something? What do you mean, a conviction or something? I want to go home. If you, if you want a conviction or something like that, you see the way my car's coming, now you're trying to tell me I'm going this way. I'm not. My car's coming this way. All we go is on the physical evidence that shows. Look, tell me so I can hear you. I just said all we go on is the physical evidence. All right, then what, well, what's the physical evidence see? Right there. Look at that. I was the coming this way? You got a brush knocked down, you got skid marks right by the curb. Okay, then how did my car get like it is? I don't know. It I didn't went say over it. to Enways. Oh, come on, cat. You're beginning to sound like Frankie Alberts now. I'll go to jail and I'll write in jail. But I go that way. I have a feeling. That's where I live. You may live there, but I have a feeling that care. you're going the other care. way because jail no is sympathy. that way. I don't want no sympathy. Well, that just about winds things up here. So uh, let's uh, make our way on back to the car here. You know, Sergeant, I couldn't help but be amused at that fellow back there. I know it isn't very funny. Don, uh, remember the drunk we had last week, the one that hit the telephone pole? Yeah. Remember when we had to go up and tell his wife she was a widow? It wasn't very funny either. on patrol for the better part of an hour. Let's see, a few moments ago, we uh, thought we were in pursuit of a hot car. At least, uh, it was on the stolen car list, but it turned out to be a gentleman who forgot where he parked his car, reported it stolen, and then remembered where he left it and forgot to call the police. So the <laughs> result was a very surprised driver when we hauled him over to the curb. You never know, do you, Sergeant? No. Don, you notice that uh, young boy walking across the street there? Where? One uh, one of the newspaper news are. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see him. I'll bet you ten to one he stole that newspaper. What do you mean? Well, I've stopped that boy at least 15 times the last year. Same thing, stealing newspapers, magazines, petty things. Let's go over and have another talk with him. Okay. Well, let's get out and see what this is all about. Paper you got in your hand? At the uh, stand. On Washington Boulevard? Yeah. What did you use for money? I just wanted to read the paper. I would, I would bring back. Did you put any money in there? No. How many times have I told you about this taking of newspapers and things that don't belong to you? I was going to return it as soon as what I read the What time did you take it? All around 6.30, Around 6.30 and it's now 11.30 and you're going to take it back. You think that they're going to be able to sell that newspaper now? Yeah. You think they will? I just wanted to read the comics. What are we going to do with you on this taking of things that don't belong to you? It's only ten cents. I mean, seven cents. It doesn't make any difference how much it is. Would you like to have somebody take something from you that's worth ten cents and keep doing it all the time? No. Well, then why do you do it with somebody else? I didn't think. We ought to put you someplace where you'll do a little thinking. I think we'll start by taking you home to your mother. It took us about uh, three minutes to get to this young fellow's home. We're uh, pulling into the curb, and uh, apparently that's the boy's mother standing out in front. Now, let's uh, get out with the sergeant. Come on, son. Where's your son? Where was 
see. He was walking down from the theater. There's a newspaper that he took off of the stand without paying for it. And what are we going to do about him? This is stealing. And you're supposed to be home at 10? Well, what am I supposed to do with you? I thought you were a good boy. What made you change? Why do you do what you're not supposed to do? Didn't I explain to you that even though you see a straight pin and you think it's nothing, any kind of a thing that you think is nothing, it's still, if it belongs to someone else, that might be precious to that other person. And you can't steal. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Don't you believe anything I tell you? Yes. Well, why do you do those things? Do you realize that what you did tonight, I don't care how small it is, that's a mortal sin. God didn't say how much or how little to steal. He says, thou shalt not steal, didn't he? Even if you'd starve to death. God wouldn't let you starve. He'll take care of you. But you don't have to steal. I don't understand. I don't know whether I say the right things or not sometimes. Here is the newspaper. I would suggest that tomorrow morning he go put seven cents in the stand where he got it. And then uh, I think maybe both you and your son should come down to the next juvenile hearing, which will be next Wednesday night. Let's find out what's going on and see what we can't get this boy straightened out. Could you look in once in a while? Sure. That might help. Sure. Uh, I'd be very I'd happy to. It. Very happy to. Thank you, Paul. All right. Don't worry about it. We'll work it out. Okay. You let me know if you got any problems. Okay? Good night, then. You are listening to Night Watch and following a detective unit on its tour of duty. Every voice, every sound is authentic. The investigations are recorded as they actually occur. We'll bring you the final results of tonight's cases at the conclusion of The Night Watch. We take you now back to car 54, somewhere in the field, and police recorder Don Reed. We're back on patrol again. We may run into a bit of weather before the night's over with. Just kind of glancing out the window, a strong wind is whipping the trees along the street. It could be we're in for some rain before long. We're cruising in the area. All units, all units in the vicinity and car 51. 211 just occurred in the market at Jefferson and Dover. Yeah, red light. Yeah, red light. Yeah, red light. Yeah, red light. Here's a red light, Sergeant. Holding on that call. It's a 211. That's a whole lot. Cutting an our siren now. Since we're a detective unit, we carry the lens in the glove compartment of the car, and consequently, we had to put it on by hand just a moment ago. We'll continue this uh, Code 3 run to get us through the traffic, but as soon as we get in the area, we'll cut it off and go in with just a red light because there always remains the possibility we may be able to intercept the suspects leaving the scene. Holding on now because we're approaching this intersection. The sergeant is using uh, second gear as we come in now. This gives us added power we need in case of emergency, and at the same time, it sort of acts as a brake. Now we're approaching the area. The siren is cut off. We'll go the rest of the way on our own. Checking the streets as we go to see if there's anything of an unusual nature, fast moving car, perhaps someone running. And looking ahead, down the street several blocks, I can see the red lights of another one of our detective units rolling in from the north. In a moment, we'll be swinging into the curb. There's the market off on the right. A group of people are milling around the front door. Just inside, a couple of clerks are standing by, apparently waiting for us. They'll probably be the victims of this holdup. Here we are. Let's get right in there. I'm Sergeant Burton of the Police Department. This is Lieutenant Collin. Here's our identification here. We had a robbery in your store just a few minutes ago. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's go. Can you tell me what happened, sir? Well, uh, I ran up while the young fellow was 
just him stepping back away from the register after she had slammed uh, the drawer on his fingers when he tried to reach in. And as I got there, the elder fellow was standing at the end of the check stand. He threw his gun and commanded the younger fellow to get back in and make her open the register. You're the clerk of the store, ma'am. Uh, what did you observe? Well, they walked in and asked me for where the peanut butter was. And I showed the young fellow where the peanut butter was. And he uh, came up the check stand. And as I opened the drawer, he put his hand in the drawer. I slammed the drawer on his hand. He pulled back and walked away, and I locked the register. The uh, elder fella pulled the gun and asked the young fella to open the register. He couldn't because I had locked it. Therefore, he asked me to get busy and open the register, as I did. And he grabbed all the money out of the register. Approximately how much money did he take, do you know? $190. $190. And uh, when uh, they got the money, did they walk out the front door? Or yes. what exit did they make? Yes, sir. They ran out the front door. The man with the gun went first. The man with the gun went first. first no, the phone phone. Or did you see a car? Yes, we could see a car. And I ran out the door. And they were just leaving, and, uh, well, I took it for about a 46 Olds or Dodge old model. <clears throat> I got the numbers, but I don't know if I had them cracked. Got the license number. Yeah, I don't know if they were the right ones, but they were getting away then. Okay, sir, if you'll let me have the license numbers of the car, I'll broadcast it right away, and then if you'll stand by and uh, give a detailed report to the uniform officers. At uh, present, I'm riding in an undercover car with Detective Sergeant Ward and uh, Detective Walter. About four hours have passed since the holdup, and here's how the investigation has progressed so far. Using that license number obtained by a citizen, we telegraphed uh, Sacramento and located the registered owner, and he has a police record, and uh, we've identified him as the younger one of the pair. The Sergeant Perkins and his partner have gone to downtown Los Angeles to check out some fingerprints found at the scene. Uh, we ourselves here in car 55 have checked out three known places frequented by the suspect, but we've had no luck so far. That is until a few moments ago when uh, Control 1 radioed the younger of the two suspects was sighted in the Bay City and known to be heading for an address in Los Angeles. Uh, Detective Walter is contacting Control 1 by radio. 55 to Control 1. Would you contact the West Los Angeles station and get a hold of Sergeant Barr of the felony detail and tell him that we're in route to the location to stake the place until we get there. And four. About 15 minutes has passed since we uh, received that radio message and we're in the area of the suspect's house now. Turning a corner. This should be his street. Now we're cruising by the house and checking cars as we go. There it is. There's his car over on the left-hand side. And just looking back at the license plates, that's it, all right. A little tension is building up in the car. I can feel it. Coming up to the corner and across the street in the shadows are a group of officers, some plain clothes and some in uniform. That would be the L.A. felony unit. Now we're pulling into the curb. And in just a moment, we'll get out of the car. Now we're crossing the street. There's a slight rain falling right now. And it, the wind makes it icy cold. Let's, uh, let's cross on over now to the officers. A break for it, we'll be able to follow him in the car. Do you know him, Mike? Yeah, I booked him once. Well, let's, uh, why don't we start all these automobiles where we can use them? Well, suppose the uniform men take the car, because they got a red light and siren, they're in uniform. And uh, the rest of us guys take the apartment. Okay. In case okay. that car takes off, you guys don't let nobody take it. And he's paid away. for. Okay. Uh, he's paid for. He's paid for. Okay. Okay. That means he's, he's the one. He's armed. Considered dangerous. Don't take any chances. <clears throat> why don't one of you call the city boys go with our guys? Well, if just two of you, yeah. two of us. Well, one of you guys ought to go with us, and uh... I'll go with Ward, and Walter, you go with the sergeant. Okay, oh, fine. Right. You know okay. the guy. 
Yeah. All of the officers are down the street now. Shotguns are out. They're walking very rapidly. Officers are running now. So am I to get out of the light. Try to get under the cover of these trees. Here's the picture. I back in at the trees. Two plainclothes officers circling the house from the rear. Three are out in front. Now let's wait and see what happens. There goes two officers in the front door. Just across the way from me. I can still see two officers take out and back. And from my position, they're in the dark, but I can see their shadows. Incidentally, the revolvers are drawn. There's the signal. They've got him. Let's go. Across the way, the suspect is pinned to the wall and is handcuffed. Apparently, he was taken by surprise. Let's see what he has to say. Would you take these off? I ain't gonna go no place. Where's the gun at now? He's got it with him. What kind of gun was it? I don't know. Where was he at when you left? He was with me. He had a gun on me. When you left, where was he at? When I left where? Up there, you mean? Yeah. He was in the hotel there. Look, uh, let's take him on out the station and get away from all this confusion. Uh, John, uh, check out the rest of the room as we can try to find that gun. Okay, fella, let's go. We are located now in the detective bureau at police headquarters. Here's the picture. The suspect we just put under arrest at his home is sitting at a desk and is being questioned by Sergeant Ward with Sergeant Perkins and Detective Waller taking notes. The interrogation has been going on for about 30 minutes. Now, just a point of clarification. We have two bandits involved in an armed robbery. The young suspect we have in custody, the older suspect is still at large. Now, Sergeant Ward is questioning the younger one here at the office about his part in the robbery and at the same time is trying to get more information regarding the older suspect. And he said, pull into the store there. So I turned left and stopped, mm -hmm. you know. And there was no other car there then. And so we just got out, and I just got out and walked in the store normally. And, and he said, uh, he stood there at the gate door, you know, waiting for me, you know. So I asked the lady, I said, where's the peanut butter at? And uh, she said, over here. And she handed me a little jar, you know. And I said, no, I want the big size. So she gave me the big one, and I walked to the cash register, and he whips his gun out, and he says, Okay, lady, stand aside and get the money. I reached out, and, and the lady shut the thing, and she said, You go on and get out of here. And I stepped back, and I started to walk out. And, and uh, then she started calling. This guy was working there. He looked at me, and so I just pushed it like that, and it wouldn't open. And, she, and he said, Open the cash register. And I just took the money out. And I looked at him and he said, okay, go on, get in the car, you know. Where'd you put the money, in your in your pocket? Right here in this pocket. You didn't put it in a bag or anything no, like that? I just stuck it right in this pocket. Mm -hmm. And so I walked out to the car. And then uh, he jumped in the car and he said, you're in this just as bad as I am. And I said, you better get out of here. So I started the car, I got scared, and I took off. Mm -hmm. So I told him, I said, well, you're going to get caught. I said, because the guy got my license number. And he said... He said, well, maybe you're going to get caught, but I'm not going to get caught. Mm -hmm. And so he says, the best thing for you to do, he said, you better get out of town until you get some money, you know. Because he said, if you want to get 10 years, it's okay with me. So I, I drove down the street and I parked in front of my house and he said, okay, give me the money, you know. So I reached my pocket and pulled it all out and gave it to him, you know. How about any other jobs that he told you about? He said he'd been doing it for a long time. He oh. said he'd been doing it ever since he was 16 years old. Uh -huh. Perkins. Well, it's probably just as well you didn't try to go out that back window. Probably wouldn't be talking to us now. The suspect is being escorted out of the office, and I've just been handed a note stating that the two victims of this robbery are here at the station, and in just a moment, we'll head for the cell block and the lineup. I'm uh, speaking now from the cell block here at the police station, and directly ahead of me are five.
five individuals lined up. Two of them are detectives, one is a clerk, a citizen, and the suspect. And now, in just a moment, as I'm speaking, Lieutenant Conlon, Chief of Detectives, is going to bring in the two victims of the holdup, and they will attempt to pick out of this lineup the suspect they believe that held them up. Now, bear in mind that the suspect we are holding here in the cell is wearing a green jacket and a white shirt. Look over this group here and see what you can see. See if you recognize. Fellow in the middle. Fellow in the middle. Is that the one you? Green jacket on you. The green jacket. Your posse poster. That's the one that was in the place Mm -hmm. whenever you were your uh, cashier was held up. Good. And your positive identification. Okay. Just a minute. I get it clear. Would you look over those men there and see which one took the money from the cash register? Yes, the one with the green jacket. You positively identify him? Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much. The uh, witnesses are leaving the cell block now, and uh, Sergeant Perkins is taking the prisoner back to the cell. Well, Sergeant. Well done. One down, one to go. You have been listening to Actual Investigations as recorded from Detective Unit 5-4 on The Night Watch. And now back to Police Headquarters and Chief W.N. Hildebrand. In the case tonight of the person involved in the automobile accident, the officers themselves did not observe the suspect driving the vehicle. Therefore, he was arrested for violation of City Ordinance 447, which is plain intoxication. In the case involving the young suspect in an armed robbery, he was booked on violation of Section 211 of the Penal Code, the penalty of which is not less than five years in state prison. The Detective Bureau, under Lieutenant Bob Conlon, had the full identity of the second suspect involved in this robbery, and a crew of detectives are working on the case at the present time. As you heard tonight... No police department can be effective without the combined efforts of the citizens and their realization of the problems encountered by their officers. If, through this program, our department can further that cause, then our efforts shall be well rewarded in bringing you Night Watch. Thank you, Chief Hildebrand. You have just heard on-the-scene reports of your police force in action. Every voice, every sound has been real. Night Watch is brought to you through the cooperation of the Police Department of Culver City, California, and is produced by Sterling Tracy and Jim Hedlock, with technical advice by Police Sergeant Ron Perkins, and is described in the field by police recorder Don Reed. <laughs>